All right. All right, Tick, I see 10 a.m. <laughs> okay. All right, well, good, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Um, thank you for joining us uh, for the first Open Education Fellows, eCampus Ontario OE Fellows webinar. I'm so excited um, for this webinar series. Uh, in this first webinar, we're talking about open media and our friends, um, Laura Killam, Jessica O'Reilly, and Helen DeWard are presenting with us and for us, and they will introduce themselves as they go along. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes um, with this um, environment that we're using, Zoom. On the bottom of your screen, if you roll down, you have a few controls, including opening a chat window. Um, and once you do that, um, you'll be able to see the chat on the right or wherever you've placed it. Also, when someone's presenting and we're screen sharing, sometimes your computer might put you into full screen mode. If you press escape, you'll get a little bit more control over how the browser window looks. Uh, and be able to see some more things. We'll be adding links as we go along, uh, and Jessica will be monitoring the chat, and I'll be helping to monitor the chat as well. Um, and our presenters will, will seek uh, dialogue and questions as they go along. Um, and is it, uh, sorry to ask, is it you that's going first, Laura? It's me. Okay, hi Helen, thanks, sorry, <laughs> I should know that. Okay, so I'm gonna get started with Helen and, uh, and we'll be keeping an eye on all the technology and look forward to, uh, to hearing the presentation. Thanks, Helen. Good, and good morning, everyone. Let's start by introducing ourselves. I'm Helen DeWard, I'm an instructor with Lakehead University at the Faculty of Education in Aurelia. And the courses that I teach are media and digital literacies, critical digital literacies. So media production in all shapes and forms. Um, I've been integrating audio and video, obviously, into the course content for both online and face-to-face -face, uh, teaching scenarios or contexts. Laura? Hi, uh, I'm Laura Killam. I basically just love both using video and encouraging faculty to use video in their teaching. And I work uh, with Jess in the uh, Teaching and Learning Hub at Cambrian. Hi everyone, Jess O'Reilly. As Laura said, I work in Cambrian College's Innovation Hub. I mostly support online and blended uh, best practice and instructors who are teaching in that mode. And I'm also an online student right now, uh, completing a doctorate in distance education through Athabasca. So I have that lens as well. Thank you. And it's my pleasure to work with the, these two dynamic uh, educators today. Um, our goal initially is to tell the story of what we do and how we how we do it, uh, making sure that we're grounding this in best practice, in um, high impact um, teaching strategies. So we're going to use the community of inquiry model to anchor and uh, weave in the universal design for learning principles as well. So the outcome for our presentation um, is um, probably. Uh, we talk about the plot line of the story. This is how we want the story to evolve. And at the end of it, um, once we've reached, <laughs> reached that piece, these are the pieces that hopefully you can look back over the story and say, yes, I, I understand this a little bit better. So starting this, we would really like to just kind of ground this in the research from the community of inquiry model that comes from uh, Garrison, Anderson, and Archer. There's a, a deep um, repository of resources available on the COI website from Athabasca University. And we talk about this being a framework that creates these deep and meaningful, collaborative, constructivist um, types of learning experiences. And we talk about um, engaging the students, um, supporting them as they uh, talk about the content and the topics that you have, set the climate of the course that you, um, you're teaching, whether it's face-to-face -face or uh, blended or online, totally online, and then to make sure that they can show what they know at each point in the, in the course design. So teaching presence is where you get a chance to show your students who you are, 
um, to show what you know about the course content, to manage the instruction, to facilitate the conversations they'll have and provide the instruction um, for the, the pieces that they may be missing as they, they go through the course. Social presence, a key piece that engages the students effectively and emotionally. Um, students will remember how they felt in the course more than they'll remember the facts and details of the course. And it's that um, welcoming feeling, a sense of belonging, a sense of control, um, accomplishment, a willingness to engage, um, and a questioning attitude and an and, and, and inquisitive mindset. And the cognitive presence really is the piece that engages the mind in that collaborative construction where their thinking is active and, and it's evident in what they're doing and, and what they're showing you. And uh, an opportunity for voice and choice. So the key, you know, talking about key issues, stimulating questions, you know, identifying, um, you know, rich uh, responses from others in the course as well. And then the metacognitive piece at the end. So they've got that sense of what it is they're learning because they're, they're thinking deeply about what they've accomplished in a course. And all of this we're framing today in terms of video and audio as an alternate means of, of response uh, to enrich the text responses that we rely on. So why use audio or video? For me, it's communication, relationship, and focusing your learning, focusing the learning in really strategic ways. Uh, an example is just this past week where I've, I've reframed student thinking around how to blog, how to write a blog post, and to remind them that it's not an essay. So as you design a course, you think about um, what it is you want to communicate, and how it's going to engage um, your students in that relationship with the content of the course or with each other or with you as the instructor. And students should be um, having lots of opportunity to, to build that communication into the course in multiple means. So this is really relying on a lot of research that's been done around audio video production. I participated for a number of years with Humanizing Online Teaching and Learning. It's a, a human MOOC. And a number of researchers were involved in that project um, and some, some rich research that came out of it, um, specifically around how to make yourself as the instructor of a course um, human as opposed to uh, um, algorithmic. Um, this is work by Dr. Whitney Kilgore, Michelle Pacansky brock Matt Cro Dr. Matt Croslin, Mahal Frey, uh, Phil Ice is another one of the researchers. And there is a resource called the Humanizing Online Teaching and Learning um, Human MOOC Pressbook uh, available that is, is openly accessible. And the link will be in the show notes. So in order to make it meaningful, you build a variety of things in. For me, it's all about media and the media triangle, knowing the, the, the audience, knowing the, the production techniques that you want to use, and then building in the, the message, the media message that you want to share, how, what message you want to communicate, and, and picking a variety of things. This is a, a course trailer that I do, uh, did um, end of August for the course that's coming up just to excite the students about what they were going to be learning with me and I used Lego minifigs because um, the student the students any student would like to do play with Lego minifigs and then the first class of a face-to-face -face class I actually brought the minifigs into class and we used those as an icebreaker so the the pieces tied together and ultimately in all of this, audio and, audio and video is and should be part of that universal design for learning strategy and engaging students in multiple means and multiple mechanisms, tools, methodologies to engage them, um, ha have them represent and show what they know and um, provide actions and interactions uh, and expressions for each other within that course. So elevating it to a self-directed, self-regulated, someone who comprehends the course content 
and shows exec, uh, executive functions as they're going through the course. Okay, if there's any questions before we move on to um, a little more detail about audio and video, you can just pop them into the uh, chat window and we'll try and respond to them. Yes, thank you, Naomi. That's a great idea. I, 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 the students really enjoyed it, that's for sure. Um, bringing the, the um, elements from the course trailer into the first day. What is meant by multiple means of representation? A multiple means of representation comes from the, um, I use the CAST uh, UDL guidelines and the link will be in the show notes and is also linked on this slide. So multiple means of multiple means of representation is anything from the perception, ways that you um, display information, alternatives for audio or video um, information, um, talks about language and symbols, clarifying vocabulary um, and the semiotics that might be involved in the course content, understanding the nomenclature that you're experiencing in the course, and then ultimate leading them to full comprehension, activating um, background knowledge into it, highlighting patterns, visualization processes, and then transfer and generalization are the pieces that are from the CAST uh, website. And I'll okay. actually elaborate a little bit on uh, multiple means of representation when I speak about audio. So why don't I speak about audio? Yes, um, and I'll respond, <laughs> I'll respond to Maureen's uh, question in the chat. Awesome. So I'm specifically looking at why audio and I always come at learning from the lens of an online instructor. That's my primary means of, of teaching. I've also been a student in an asynchronous online environment and I'm sure it comes as no surprise to you that these courses tend to be extremely text heavy. So oftentimes there's a reading, you should respond to the reading in a forum post and then reply to students' responses. So there's a formula that I see repeat over and over across entire programs as a matter of fact. I'm teaching in a college context and my demographic of learners is, is quite varied. I see my students come into the course typically late at night on the weekend, most work full time, they have families. Uh, text is not their primary means of communication or their preferred mode. Oftentimes English is their second or third language. They would characterize as hands-on learners. And so that read, respond mantra doesn't necessarily meet them where they are. It's important for me that my students both learn from and enjoy my courses. And so uh, media has actually helped me reach them and elevate their, their learning outcomes, in my opinion. So on screen right now, I've got two examples. On the left is a simple announcement that I push out weekly to my students. So this is actually taken from a blended delivery from last year. And you'll see that I've got an audio file embedded in there. The audio file is fairly inconspicuous. I don't call a ton of attention to it uh, on the mobile phone. It's, it's in a different location, but still fairly uh, small. And what I'm doing is I'm just simply reading out my message to my students. It's a small change, but students have told me that it's helped them adjust to my Northern Ontario accent. It's helped them, uh, you know, just consolidate learning by reading while also listening and they've even told me that hearing my voice actually helps them tune into my mood my health my energy so if I record with a raspy voice I get a few get well soon messages and and that's always touching and it humanizes the online teaching experience for me on the right hand side, this is actually uh, an H5P interactive tool. It's called uh, Course Presentation. This I icon opens up essentially uh, closed captioning of the audio file contained here. So students have the option to click and, and hear 
the audio narration, or they can click and, and simply read or do a little bit of both. So this aligns with the universal design for learning uh, principle of providing multiple means of representation. And a nice entry point for most instructors is to consider, okay, how do I make my visual audio? How can I make audio more visual? And so these are two examples of how I have achieved that in small ways to, to support learner engagement. The other nice piece about audio for my teaching is it, it, like Helen said, it does humanize me. So they pick up on, on how I'm feeling. They understand that I'm, I'm a person, not a robot. And I've actually seen pretty significant changes in my interactions with students when I do make efforts early in the course to engage and enhance my social presence. Um, I find that email correspondence is a lot more polite. Students are more open to providing constructive criticism about the course, which I'm always open to. And I've even have, had students say, you know what, Jess, I wouldn't have asked to meet with you if you didn't seem like you were a nice person. And I could tell <laughs> that you were nice based on the, you know, the inflection in your voice, the videos that you use. So Laura will cover video next, but I like to remind instructors that audio can help help with this. And if you're not someone who's comfortable recording or videotaping yourself, or maybe you're just interested in spoken word, you happen to be a podcast fan and you're interested in learning how to produce audio, this is a great first step into that media enhancement. I've also toyed with um, audio feedback on assignments. It doesn't work for all students, but it is a nice option for some. Podcasting content, interviewing experts in audio format, or even analyzing audio sources. So I can think of several audio tracks that I've heard in my life that had a profound emotional impact on me. What a great primary source to analyze and discuss in class. Finally, there's the cognitive presence piece. So students can produce audio too. Sometimes we forget that they all have uh, typically microphone, headphones, video camera right in their pocket at any time. And so you can encourage your learners to create audio either for their own learning purposes or as products in the course. So for example, I'm seeing many students taking voice memo recording as opposed to handwritten notes. Um, I see them posting audio files in my text-based forums because they can now. Uh, we use Moodle at Cambrian and, and that feature is, is enabled in Moodle. And then that reflective blogging piece can also take an audio format if you encourage it. Not all students will respond, so I, I would recommend that you throw it out there as an alternative, as an option, not uh, a, a thou shalt or a mantra. You'll get less resistance that way. Assuming that I've sold you on audio as a concept, I now want to get into a bit of the, the nitty gritty in, um, you know, I've got uh, just under four minutes to show you everything you need to know about producing audio. So here we go. This sounds funny, but actually there is some warm up uh, involved in producing a quality audio file. You want to warm up your mouth, um, use a few tongue twisters just to get things working, particularly early in the morning. I try to avoid those distracting verbal sounds by just running through. You know, we tell our students to practice for presentations. Well, we can do that too. However, you're hearing your voice back and picking up on every little verbal tick. You likely have these verbal tics in class, but you're not hearing it so you're less conscious of them. It's okay to have a few imperfections in your recording. It can actually sound more authentic that way. And then something that really distracts me, like I'll turn a CBC interview off if the interviewer is having those mouth sounds, the saliva sounds. That can be a result of two things. You may be underhydrated or overhydrated. So you want to avoid anything that is going to suck saliva out of your mouth for a few hours ideally before you record. So that's coffee, cigarettes, anything like that, a halls um, or throat lozenge. Try to avoid them. Prehydrate with water. Uh, professional voice artists actually will start hydrating the night before a recording. 
well you record, tiny sips of water only. And I've actually heard, that this is contentious uh, in the industry, but some say that if you eat a green apple, has to be green, right before you record, you'll have better uh, outcomes in terms of the recording and, and it helps to eliminate those mouth sounds. Even if it's a placebo effect, if you're nervous to record, eat an apple and convince yourself you'll be amazing, and you will be. Well, you record. So I like to promote Audacity uh, for a few reasons. Audacity is um, an open source software, which I love. Their source code is available online. Anyone can learn from it, use it. They're built entirely on a community of volunteers and it's free. So you can download it and use it at home. The interface is maybe somewhat uh, intimidating for beginners, but what you'll find is you tend to use the same features over and over again. So you'll, you'll get yourself into a bit of a cycle. And the other piece is there's great YouTube videos out there that walk you through the basics of Audacity. So even if you find that one video that is like accessible, you like it, it's short, it's, it gets to the point for you, just favorite that video and go back to it as a reference. My top three pieces of advice for faculty new to recording is uh, to leave a bit of silence somewhere on the track. That will help you edit out background noise later. Make sure that you're listening and adjusting because you really can't fix a bad recording. It, it will actually start to sound worse over time. So you want to get it as, as good as possible in that first go. Um, and then remember that little mistakes happen. You don't have to stop, delete, go back. I see that impulse all the time. You can edit out little um, mess ups if it's, say, in the middle of a sentence. I advise faculty to just stop take a breath, restart that sentence rather than the entire track. All right, hosting, I'll leave you with this. So let's imagine that you followed me all the way through, you've created this amazing audio file, you've learned how to uh, edit it, it's sounding great, you gotta get it somewhere on the internet for your students to access. I tend to host just in my Google Drive because it's simple for me and uh, it, it works, but I would like to explore SoundCloud, particularly because there are some social features built into that platform that I think are really excellent. So for example, um, I can post at particular timestamps on SoundCloud and engage in a conversation about that particular point in the audio file. So in my practice, I would like to open up and, and invite students to engage in dialogue about audio files um, in intentional ways. So, so that's on my goal list for next year. The last piece that I'll leave you with is, you know, we talk about learner voice in metaphor all the time in education research, but we can actually bring in real human voices into our learning experience, both our own and our learners, and cultivate that kind of intimate social environment that we see more often in face-to-face -face than in online courses. So thank you. All right, I'm gonna talk about video. And while I'm talking, I'm gonna invite you to take a look at the Padlet link that I just threw into the chat and give us some ideas about why you would possibly be using video in your, um, in your teaching practice. And I'm going to just, I'm gonna talk while you're doing it. And I'm gonna say that video can do all of the wonderful things that Jess just talked about in terms of humanizing the learning experience. Um, but with the added benefit of having the visual effects and that can be quite beneficial for visual learners in particular. Um, now when I talk about uses of video, um, sometimes people think that they're using video for their teaching if they're just you know recording their lectures and and Yes, that is a use of video, but it's probably not the most effective. You may find that your students aren't actually watching those. And I would argue that a lot of students won't sit through, you know, my classes are three hours, three hours of video while everyone's doing their breaks and having their discussions. They're not gonna get the same impact out of that as they would if you intentionally create video. When 
you're creating video for your students, there's usually a purpose in mind. If you can keep that purpose in mind, then it really impacts the length of the video, the content of the video, and all of those things. I'm going to take a look at what you guys are saying in the Padlet and adding to what people are saying here. Um, yes, a visual demonstration of a skill or technique is a really common use. Helping students work through problems. I saw a tweet, and I don't have that tweet in my presentation today, but uh, there was a student that was really impressed when they emailed their course instructor a question and they answered with video. Sometimes it's hard to answer with just audio if it's something that needs to be shown. Like we have, uh, we have an educator at Cambrian who teaches with Excel and he uses a lot of video. Well, it might be hard for him to explain in just words what he's trying to tell the students if he didn't have that visual piece on it. Conversations are a really good piece in terms of building relationships with your students. If you're, if you're um, teaching online, for example, sometimes it can be hard to have those conversations if you don't intentionally make a place for those. Um, that's hit on a lot of the points on my next slide, which is uh, so, some, of the, some of the key uses that I see people using would be the, the teaching aspect. So when I make videos that are designed to teach something, I try and keep them short and concise. There's, I'm talking to a camera, I'm not doing that lecture capture thing. Um, I find that my audience retention is generally around three to five minutes. So if my videos are getting any longer than that, I like to break them up into a series. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the conversational piece. Um, and answering frequently asked questions. I also am featuring a, uh, a screenshot here of someone else who was doing an extend and talked about how valuable it was for them to incorporate video into their teaching. Um, and I find it does, it adds a lot to the student experience and you can post those videos and you can give them to your students or you could post those videos and you can give them to the world. I'm just trying to privately message you Jess, but it's not working. So if you go to the next slide, um, if you post your videos openly, there's a chance that you're not only gonna be helping your students, but you can also be helping students from around the world. So the comments that are on your slide right now are just a few of the many screen uh, of the many screenshotable comments that I could use for this, of a video that I posted a long, long time ago, and I made it publicly available, and you can see like two years ago it helped somebody, and five days ago it helped somebody. So that one thing that you created, if you're teaching something in particular, can help a lot of people if you post it openly. Um, and so I'm just gonna go to a few tips for recording. I've had some conversations with Jess and Jeff from Cambrian. Jeff is our uh, professional video guy. And we talked about, you know, so if we are going to be encouraging faculty to do this, what's the most important thing? And just like when you're, when you're teaching in, in an everyday environment, your content is the most important thing. So you have to know what it is you're trying to communicate to your learners. And then it's actually audio. So all the wonderful tips that Jess has given to you uh, are, are good to keep in mind for when you're doing um, video as well. A student is not going to want to listen to a video if they can't hear what you're saying. So if your audio is not clear, if you've got a lot of background noise, the chances are they're not going to listen to that whole thing and then they're not going to get that content that you're trying to give. Secondly, lighting. Uh, it's good to be able to see what's going on on the camera and then after that you can worry about video quality and editing and that kind of thing. Those are really kind of, you know, added benefits like the icing on the cake, whereas the content and being able to hear it and being able to see what's going on is more important. So you don't actually have to get into any fancy editing for your videos to be um, engaging for students. Some things that I would consider if you're going to be on camera is the background. So you'll see today I've got a white background. I'm sitting in the area where I typically record YouTube videos now. It's a painted, uh, just, a, just a white painted wall. You can really use any color you want. Um, you can have stuff in the background, but I would be aware of what's in the background. Uh, if, if you listen to YouTubers talk about this, they say they intentionally sometimes put things in the background. So if I'm recording a video and it's about, you know, um, 
workouts. I might have a gym in my background, something that helps to reinforce the message. Um, and so, you know, when you're, when you're setting up your area, just, just think about where you're recording. Think about the lighting in the area, because if you're in a dark area, it's not going to pick up as well. Also, if you have access to something like a tripod, uh, it's pretty useful to have a tripod. I have created some videos by leaning my cell phone camera up against a stack of books because I didn't have a tripod and then I just pressed record and I walked over and I did my thing and then you just cut off the beginning of that. Uh, and I see some people talking about in the chat some wonderful PD sessions that we have coming up in terms of uh, video. Uh, and yeah, James, you know what? I also prefer doing video on my own. Uh, I always, it's funny. I, I did some video with Jeff at Cambrian and I do YouTube videos all the time, right? And I was like nervous <laughs> and it was hard having someone stand there. So sometimes if I just have the camera and I can look at the camera and I can picture that I'm talking to my students there, it's actually easier than have, having someone record it for me. Um, I do practice. I practice like walking around the house, driving, thinking about what I'm gonna say before I go on camera, because when I go on camera, if I haven't practiced at all, sometimes I'll draw a blank and that is not good. Um, in terms of editing, again, it doesn't need to be fancy. I did wanna talk about captioning, so because someone mentioned it earlier in the chat. Captioning is something that is important to have now for uh, AOTA compliance. Um, YouTube actually does a fairly good job and uh, I can give you a link to some information about how to do that. But if you upload your video, it'll do a first run through and then you do need to edit it because uh, you know, if you're saying complicated words, not everyday words, I find that YouTube sometimes gets those things wrong. And keep in mind that there might be support at your institution for this kind of thing. Um, there are some free video editing tools out there. I haven't personally used them, but the ones that are under more below are ones that are recommended by either Jeff or YouTubers. And I guess that's a good segue to YouTube versus Vimeo. So just as the next slide. Um, there's two main players in the video hosting world. Uh, YouTube and Vimeo. Now, YouTube does a really good job, in my opinion, uh, of getting some reach out there. There's a blog post if you're interested in more of the comparison. I find that my students are very familiar with YouTube, and there's research to suggest that a lot of students are actually using YouTube for their education anyways. So my thought is, you know, go where, go where the students are. Um, Vimeo is very good for embedding things onto your website. I recently learned that, you know, if you wanted to update the link to a video, you can do that, which you can't do in video. So if I was posting a video for week one of my course, I could then change the actual content of the video after the fact, instead of going in and posting a new link, which you can't do with, uh, with YouTube. Also, um, Vimeo has better open licensing options. So YouTube only has the one CC by, and then I've been giving them a hard time lately on Twitter. I don't know if they're paying any attention to me, but I've also been saying it in conferences and stuff. They don't have the download button. So that can be problematic. Whereas Vimeo has more licensing options and they're um, a better choice in terms of if if people want to be able to download and repurpose your videos. I see some good chat going on. Um, that's good. Thank you. All right. In terms of learning to, um, learning to do video production, there are a few resources on, uh, on this slide here. One is a website that, um, a variety of people have contributed to over the course of several conferences. There's a four up there right now, and Jess and Jeff and I from Cambrian are going to be putting some materials linked on that website as well for the upcoming online learning conference. And we're going to actually be trying to develop uh, some, some checklists and things like that. So we think it's a good resource. Um, and there's a menu that you can skip to different sections that you're interested in. Also, I learned almost everything that I know about uh, video production from watching YouTube videos. 
Now they're not as in depth maybe as what you would want as you get more advanced. So something like the lynda.com courses that eCampus Ontario has provided funding for, for us to have access for. It was at three years. I don't know how many years we got left, um, but that's a great resource to go to in terms of an online learning uh, resource that will guide you more step by step. I find on YouTube, it's kind of all over the place and like people repeat other people. So it's not maybe the most efficient use of your time, but if you're looking for like little tips on something specific, like this video is how to feel comfortable on camera. I got a really good tip on that one when I was first doing on camera videos about like if you stand on your toes, it helps to relieve some of the pressure. I was like, oh, that's a really good tip. So since they do video all the time, they can speak to some of those things. Oh, we got access through 2020. That's awesome. The website link, uh, let me grab it for you. I will throw it in the chat. Are there any questions before we move on to Helen's? Helen's got something else for you and then I got a little wrap up activity. Okay, I'm just gonna read the question so that I can then answer it and people who are watching the recording can hear. What about intentionally engaging asynchronous learners while recording the lecture, such as going up to the camera, asking students to pause the recording and try out an activity, pausing for breaks and pausing while students work on activities in class? Yeah, you know what? I would think that that would add, like if you're trying to do a, le a lecture capture approach, whenever you've got virtual learners and in-person learners, you definitely wanna be speaking to those people. The challenge with just using a, um, a lecture capture approach is that it can be hard for the student to keep their attention through the whole thing. So maybe if you take your lecture capture and you, and you edit it on purpose, that would be better. The other problem, and I know you're from Cambrian, so I'm just gonna say, if you're doing lecture capturing in your classroom, like your body is this big, so they can't really see you very well. So it might be better to do an edit of the video, to break the video up, or to on purpose take the content from that hour or three hour class. What would you say if it was an elevator pitch and try and put that into a video? Um, that, would be, that would be, I would say, best practice. Maybe not something that you can do right now when you're trying to teach something new. I'm gonna, did I miss, I, I saw lots of great chat going on. I just, I probably missed some questions because I was focusing on what I was saying. I think one of the points that came out in the chat is the, the benefit, the value of having a script for the video production that you're doing. Sometimes you don't necessarily need it if it's going to be, you know, under 60 seconds, but for the most part, it's good to have that because then you can use that script as the transcript for the video as well. So you don't have to rely on um, YouTube to do the, uh, the transcription for you. Yeah, that's a great point. So there's, there's two main approaches in my mind to doing video. And one is exactly what you said, scripting, which a lot of my older videos are scripting. And then I've got a screen capture. I'm not actually on camera. I find scripting most useful for that. Unless you have a teleprompter, which I don't have at home, um, it's really hard to follow that exact script. So you'd still probably need to do some edits. And the other one is, depending on how familiar I am with my content, sometimes it's more effective for um, conversational style things in particular to have some key points that I wanna hit on because I, it's easier for me to be more genuine. And something that I think I forgot to mention is that um, when you're recording video, it's really important that you don't sound like you're bored. So I practice using different tones of voice to try and keep my learners engaged because if I sound like I'm bored with what I'm saying, the students aren't gonna pay attention and they're not gonna, they're not gonna watch the video. And I personally have a harder time doing that sometimes if I'm scripted and I'm in front of a camera. If I'm scripted and I'm doing screen capture, it's much easier, but I find that in front of a camera, it's easier for me to have talking points. But each individual has their own um, approach, I think. So uh, when you're asking about webcams in terms of an online classroom, I think that that's a little, uh, th th that's a very good point. So I find it hard to read my students when I'm teaching online and I can't see their faces and I'm someone who is taught most of the time in person. So it's kind of difficult to, um, 
to, to engage with them sometimes. The challenge that I've had with students using their own webcams is that sometimes then they might be more reluctant to have the recording posted. So when using Zoom, I keep those separate now um, and, I, and I tell them that I'll edit that out. The, I do have uh, essentially a capture of the online discussion, like, kind of like a lecture capture where I edited it. So I zoomed in so that the students weren't on there because then they'd be more reluctant to have it posted and it's important to have everybody else have things posted. But yes, I like to encourage them to use a webcam, but I don't like to force them to use one. Oh, you're talking about having a webcam on the student in the classroom so the people watching online can see them. Um, I don't know, Je oh, Jess did already respond. There we go. Bring a webcam uh, with a USB cord and put it at the front of the class. Yeah, Jess actually did that in a meeting that we had the other day. So a couple of people couldn't come in person and they were like on a tripod on an iPad actually like in the room. That was a really good solution. Jess is a genius. Okay, so now we're just going to spiral back a little bit to um, back to the, um, the COI model and where we want our students to be in terms of social, emotional um, connection to the course content, to each other, to be cognitively engaged in the topics, um, being able to model or showcase um, what they are, are know, they are learning in the course, and then how we as educators and learners can show what we know. And for all three of us as presenters to this, we advocate, obviously, and use and model for our students the use of video and audio as all means of communication, of building relationships, um, engaging into deeper discourse around topics that are meaningful, um, and ultimately working our way through this uh, spectrum of voice that... Uh, um, Beth Bray has um, demonstrated with students at the center of it and we want them to become the future leaders of our of our world in order to do that we need to shift them towards that leadership role and taking taking on the responsibility of being present socially emotionally cognitively in the courses that we teach and then building the connection for them to people who are present in their fields of endeavor so for me my one example is for students to show uh, leadership in audio production I, ha I actually had a couple of students do an audio recording that was not part of their coursework but was as an invitation from somebody i know who does podcasting and they've had an opportunity to share their voice in a real authentic way, uh, build some digital literacy skills as they do it, and, and model for their classmates, model for other teacher candidates, um, how they can do that. Another example is having, in my case, an educator from the field coming into the classroom through a video conference um, that can or can't you know is recorded or not recorded and sharing their voice with my students and we're we're doing one example of that tonight and we had one last week we've I've built that into the course design each year so that it's not just my voice they're listening to they're they're listening to voices from the field of education um, that it, it has meaningful connection to the course content and makes them think more deeply about the topics that we're talking about so I encourage you uh, um, to pick one, to start with one, to tinker and play with one. And if you get stuck to reach out to any one of us here, um, just through a tweet or an email or a, a direct message in some way, um, to, re to, to talk to us, because I, I, I know we'll support you in, in what you att are attempting to do to engage your students and put them at the center of the learning. Okay, and now as Helen was suggesting, we would like you to try it. 
So I have a link here that I'm going to throw into the chat for a Flipgrid. Uh, if you haven't heard of Flipgrid, it is now free to use for educational purposes. And we are going to encourage you to, sorry, we're going to encourage you to give us a two sentence summary of what your takeaways are from the webinar. So maybe something you learned or something that hit home for you. Now I did allow up to five minutes, but by no means do you need to have five minutes in your videos. Something that I wanted to um, say is that it's important, I think, when you're creating videos, not to be a perfectionist, because every time you shoot a video, you'll get a little bit better. And if you wait until it's perfect, you might never feel 100% comfortable with the video that goes out there. That was one of the biggest challenges for me as a, uh, as a video creator. Um, and in the chat, uh, there was some questions around consent. So um, when I'm creating my own videos, it's not as much of an issue as when you're engaging students in videos. And I think the best thing to do is to consult your institutional policies, as was mentioned in the chat. And um, if you're posting something publicly, I always ask my students for consent, and I forgot to mention that. And I also offer that if we're recording, um, a, a class or if we're recording an online lecture and they said something that they want me to edit, I after I turn off the recording, I ask everybody, is there anything that you want me to edit out before I post this thing? Just to give them that, that option. So please head on over and give that a try. Uh, Jenny, I don't know if you want to pick up with your book thing. Uh, hi, yes, I can pick up with my book thing while people give that a try, which is fun. I hope we get some some takers to, to be brave and take a risk. Uh, I'm just going to share my share my screen for a moment and the link for the Flipgrid is in the chat. So that's not going to throw everything off. Yeah. Um, Jessica, you may need to stop sharing for a moment. Great. Super. Thanks. Let's see. I can do this without blowing things up. Maybe. Come on, PowerPoint. Ooh. <laughs> Someday I'll be a technology pro, but it's not today. <laughs> technology, our frenemy. Oh, huh? it's, yeah, I know. I just want, I want my play button. Come on. Oh, there we go. And sorry, that's maybe going to take over everybody's screen, which happens. So um, a couple of things. So in the background, while we were chatting, our uh, creative communications team led by Elan Paulson at eCampus Ontario uh, did a random draw for a book. Um, the book we're giving away today is called An Urgency of Teachers plus, you know, full colon and some other things in that title. Written by Sean Michael Morris and Jesse Stommel, uh, <clears throat> who um, have created and run something called hybrid pedagogy and they're amazing pedagogues and educators uh, and their book I think has been you know a kind of a life collection of work for them uh, it's a wonderful book and our winner today is Catherine Walton so Catherine congratulations um, I'm gonna ask you if you can just pop your email into the chat or send it to me privately in the chat if you want just to make sure we can connect with you uh, and just a couple of other reminders from eCampus Ontario if I may uh, our next OE Fellows webinar, uh, so this is a series, this, this one we're doing today is the first in a series, there'll be five total, and the next one is by Maureen Glynn, and she's going to be talking about embedding OER in the online course development process. So how can you as a course developer or your team at your institution uh, start to embed the idea of OER uh, in partnership with your faculty members and administrators? Um, also want to remind you that November 12th to 13th is our technology enabled seminar and showcase in Toronto. That's our big eCampus Ontario annual event. Um, tickets are very limited this year because of size and scope uh, and first come first serve tickets will open up on October 1st and there's a link in there and I'll put these links into the chat as well. Uh, and then the final thing I want to remind you about is the 9 by 9 by 25 challenge, which is being run by very ably by Terry Green. Um, Terry, do you want to say anything about that? Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, this is through Ontario Extend. Um, we're just uh, collecting uh, challengers who would be into writing about their teaching 
or they're learning or they're teaching and learning um, in nine posts in nine weeks with each post a minimum of 25 sentences um, and we have a team of, of people who can count to 25 that will be checking every <laughs> single post to be sure and will penalize you if you don't make it quite to 25. Um, anyway, we've got about, so there are 31 entries and about six of them are teams. So we're looking at about probably 40 plus people involved. And um, on the, I put a link in there to the kind of the details, but also, um, I don't know where I was going with that. Sorry. Um, if you're interested in joining, check out that link and let me know. And I'll help you get set up if you're if you're wondering more questions. All right, great. Thank you, there. Terry. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and just generally speaking, eCampusOntario.ca is our website for more information about the kinds of things we're doing. And this um, completes this um, eCampus Ontario announcement. <laughs> Let's see if I can stop sharing my screen. And I'll just take a moment to thank everyone for joining us today when uh, we, we volunteered to go first in the webinar lineup. It was a, a pretty daunting task and we're, we're, we really appreciate your presence. Um, moral support for each of us that uh, took on this task. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Helen. Thank you to all our guests. We still have time for questions. So we're going until 11 a.m. for those who are interested. I just wanted to reiterate that and as we said in the chat we're around too if you have follow-up questions. It's a little bit um, difficult in a one-hour session to talk about all of the things that we could have talked about when it comes to audio and video. So I'm sure there's going to be some you know follow-up questions as you try things and please feel free to reach out to any one of us. Well I would be remiss if I didn't also express gratitude to everyone for tuning in this morning. Thank you. And absolutely follow up. Um, if you're interested in Audacity, there is a learning curve involved and I would happily assist or be a, a champion for you as you as you learn that program in particular. And and for those who are Mac users and you have an issue with exporting uh, into MP3 files, I have the trick, the back the back end fix. The magic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm just checking in and I see if there are any more questions emerging. Lots of thanks and certainly thanks very much to everyone who's attended today as well. Um, is there, has there anything popped up on Flipgrid that, um, that you want to show or you want to talk about? Uh, I, I I haven't checked the Flipgrid yet. I think that might be... Is a post-seminar um, thing to do? Yeah, more of an asynchronous, please try this. Okay. Because I don't think the video will play very well through here. Correct me if I'm wrong, Helen. Um, you could do it as a, a screen. Yeah, a screen because share. the audio doesn't come through when you yeah, play video. Yeah, the audio doesn't come through. Right, and that's also young. a good tip. If you're planning to show a video in class, have students online know that it doesn't always come through as good as if they play it on their own devices if they're at different locations. Um, I'm seeing some thanks, and I am excited to say that I'm seeing some people say that they're actually going to try video yes. and audio, which I think is really big. I think that you know it's very much. A, a huge thanks and, and worth doing this if even just one of you goes and adds this to your teaching practice. And so if more than one of you are going to do that, that's awesome. And in the, um, in the speaker's notes uh, with the, the slide deck that we've prepared, I've, I've added a number of different links to some uh, blog posts that, that I've written about and maybe Jess and Laura can uh, again add in some of the you know, our personal experience stories as we've done it. Um, it's been two years that I've been actively um, creating and producing audio video. Um, it, there's a lot of lessons that I've learned along the way. So I won't hesitate to share, share some of those. So you Great. can avoid the, the issues. Thanks, Helen. And just to let everyone know, we are we have been and are recording today's session, which will be edited down to the to the salient points. 
Um, but I'll be transcribing and posting on our eCampus Ontario website, and we will include any and all links that the presenters want to include. So blog posts and slides and all of that good stuff. All right, everyone. Well, I'm not seeing a lot of, of burning questions emerge, and I think it's okay to end a bit early and to, uh, to give everyone five minutes back, <laughs> possibly in their days. What a wonderful session. Thank you all for, for joining us and thank you to all the presenters for their hard work in, in presenting these topics. I was just gonna write in the chat, but since you're gonna turn this off, maybe I'll just say it. Um, <laughs> if you do try any of this audio or video, please let us know and let us know what you thought of it and how it went. I would really appreciate some of that feedback because obviously we're sold, we think it's a good thing, but if you're running up uh, against any, I don't know, technical issues or anything that you think could be improved, that's also good for us to know as we're trying to support other faculty. Great, thank you. And just in case you weren't aware, in the chat window, there's a tiny little button on the bottom right called More. If you click on that button, you can save the chat. So that will save all of the links and everything to your desktop because the chat doesn't get included in the video recording. But if you want to save it and save those links, that's super great. Thanks, Jenny. That's an awesome tip. Yeah, it's one of my favorite Zoom features, actually. <laughs> All right, everyone, I'm going to close out. Thank you all and have a great Bye. day. Thank you. Bye.